Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes. God has assigned me. He has equipped me with the tools for building, to add to his foundation, to construct renovations, provides the skills and moves the complacent. God has assigned me through burdens, through pain, through sunshine, through rain, through trial, through mess, through crisis, through stress, through times of me not feeling my best. God has assigned me. In the midst of searching, in the midst of seeking guidance, his wisdom keeps me from reversing. In the midst of struggle to find and define my purpose, he assigned me. In the midst of defeat, in the midst of my fright, in the midst of me weak. He assigned me unique. 
the meek. The woman that always enters a room hiding and always trying to be discreet. He assigned me with purpose to encourage, to motivate. He has given me these words that I speak to glorify, to congregate, to be the sweet smelling aroma that never dissipates, to be the kind of love that never complicates, to be the kind of light that never goes dim but always illuminates. He assigned me, thank you. We're so grateful, Father, for who you are. Father, as many of us unite here this beautiful morning, Lord, we come before you, Father, to give you all the honor and glory, Lord. We breathe in and we thank you for your breath in our lungs this beautiful morning, Father. We thank you for waking us up, Father for giving us another chance of living life here on earth for your honor and your glory. Father, be with us this morning, Lord, as we, as we come together as one to worship the one and only true and living God. We thank you, Father, for who you are in our lives. We bow before you, Father, Speak this morning. Allow us, 
Let us bow before the King of all the nations Come, every tribe and tongue from every generation In one united cry between the earth and sky to your majesty we sing holy you are holy we cry worthy you are worthy to be holy one who saves Jesus
sing holy. We sing holy. You are holy. Yes, you are holy. holy. You are holy. Yes, you are holy. Holy, holy, holy. This Let everything come on. Let Father, thank you so much <clears throat> for the finished work of Jesus Christ, and uh, thank you so much for the finished uh, work uh, that allows us to even enter the pres your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We thank you because it wasn't always like that, that we needed a mediator between man and God um, every single time there was 
the opportunity to enter your presence. And, and God, we, are, we don't take that uh, lightly, that uh, the time of celebration and worship and singing and praising and dancing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords is given to us. Uh, but now we turn ourselves and our hearts and our minds to the authority of your word, which also is a privilege uh, because, God, you speak directly to us as individuals through it. And we pray now that you would do that. I pray that you will help me help your people understand what they need to uh, hear from you. God, as always, I pray that your word falls on good ground and bear much fruit, a fruit that will last into the next generation even to children yet unborn. And Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your unfailing love towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So for many of us, uh, giving and receiving encouragement is is hard to do. Uh, Matter of fact, I had to learn personally that everyone didn't have the motor that I have. In other words, the ability just to go, 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 and not necessarily need encouragement along the way. Uh, and maybe you're the same way that maybe you don't need too much encouragement to be about the Lord's business, but there's a lot of other people that still do need uh, words of encouragement spoken to them to navigate difficult times and just navigate uh, life itself and service unto the Lord. It's kind of like a motor of a car. That car's motor and engine would be so reliable to get you back and forth to work, get you on, and take you on vacations and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's important to service that car before the check engine light comes on. <laughs> and encouragement is, is a little bit the same way. We as a church, we as the body of Christ, our responsibility is to service each other uh, through encouragement before our check engine lights come on. Now, the reality is, some of us, <laughs> if you ever were like me when I was younger, I waited to the check engine I came on, and then I took the car. <laughs> uh, and some of us, maybe today, you're still riding around with your car with the check engine light on. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, our responsibility to each other is to make sure that we are encouraging one another. And it's important that it is uh, to exclaim one another because it isn't solely a pastor's responsibility. It isn't. You know, that's not the Bible. Uh, It's one another. It's you encouraging each other and each other encouraging each other. And I have the privilege to sprinkle encouragement in every now and then. But it's everyone's mutual responsibility to encourage one another. Makes sense? And and remember, we said that when it comes to encouragement, Maybe you're in a season that you do need to be encouraged by someone, but by George, okay, by Jesus, (laughs) you know, in his name, everyone must grow up and mature to a point that we are uh, growing in encouragement towards someone else. I like to say it this way. Uh, Yes, maybe you're, you may be in a season or you have been in a season that, Uh, you're calling someone for encouragement. It has to soon change that people are calling you to be encouraged. Make sense? And there's reciprocation in relationships that uh, you're not just uh, sitting in front and and fellowshipping with people and they draining you of all that you are in Christ, but you're also inputting life into them. Make sense? So if we're doing this to each other, it's it's super important to know that uh, only good can come out of it. So as a reminder, to remain a church community that encourages one another, we must be skilled in three things I've identified for you. The first is that we must learn how to encourage uh, through it being modeled by leaders in our church, right? Leaders in the home, leaders in the marketplace. If that fits you one way or the other, it's your responsibility to start modeling how to do this, right? Model it to your children when they're younger. Doesn't mean that they, you know, get uh, participation trophies from you, if you understand what I'm saying. It's okay to, to lose and win in life. But when you're losing, I encourage you. When you're winning, I'm encouraging you. Follow me as a parent. Not only, you know, given 
uh, again, the participation certificate uh, to a child. In other words, never letting them fail. It's good to fail. Failure is really, really good and healthy for people, right? But it's important, it's important for us to encourage. So model it. And then we, we stopped and paused, and Lisa and I, I had a chance to share with you that encouragement should also be in marriages. You see, marriages are super important because they represent Christ's relationship to the church. So when marriages are dysfunctional, right, it really communicates that could possibly our relationship with God be just as dysfunctional. We know it, it, it won't on his part, but it can on, on our part, right? So marriage is sacred that he says that we are his bride. He is the bridegroom, which says marriage is super important. So as a church, we have to foster that and we have to encourage that and, and, and display that all the more. Now, today we're going to head into our, our final phase of encouragement, and that is that we need to be an environment where people live to encourage that that is just our motto, that's just our pursuit in life, is that, you know, I want to wake up today and, and God, give me an open door to encourage somebody. Amen. Give me an opportunity to speak life into someone today. And, and that should be on our agenda every single day, and that is to encourage somebody in some unique way. Make sense? So if you can turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 to give us a springboard into uh, the key verses that we're going to land on today. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this. Now, as to the periods and times, brothers and sisters, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is coming just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety... Then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that the day would overtake you like a thief. You hear that? We shouldn't be in darkness, so it shouldn't surprise us. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night nor of darkness. So then, let's not sleep as others do. But let's be alert and sober. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let's be sober, having put, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So that whether we are awake or sleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. You hear that? Days are short. He's coming. Therefore, there's this sense of urgency. There's this priority that should be in the body of Christ. Because church, listen, one of the biggest problems with the church today is that we are losing steam. Church is never going to be overtaken because he's the head of the church. But the neck, the no, you follow me? Those other parts which we make up, it's losing steam. We say, how can you, how can you say that? Well, chances are if you walk up to a total stranger and tell them about Jesus Christ... They won't listen to you or they will make fun of you and potentially mock you. Because we have, we, not Jesus, have ruined his reputation or we have distorted his reputation. We have complicated his, rep, you know, his reputation. His reputation isn't marred because he doesn't need anyone to protect it. But those who represent him Okay, if we stand before someone, chances are they're going to question us immensely. Even guys like myself, clergy, men of the cloth, they don't trust. People don't trust us like they used to. Matter of fact, listen very closely. It is said that we are in a post-Christian society in America for sure. Post-Christian society looks just like a pre-Christian society. But the answer to the post is the same answer to the pre, which is who? 
So it's our responsibility to know that we have limited time here. So we have to get behind each other. Come on now. Come on, sis. Come on, bro. You can do it. We need to also get in front of each other and also provoke each other to righteousness and good deeds. Look in each other in the eye and say, come on, bro. You need to step it up. Remember we learned last week that we should be like a loving mother as a, as a baby is tenderly on her breast, but then like a dad saying, come on now, son. Come on. Get up. Get up. Get up. I know you bruised your knee. Shake it off. So there's that healthy balance that is needed that we need to urge each other all the more, man, that we do not have much time. So let's try to build the kingdom as quickly, as rapidly, as fervently, as as faithfully as we can. So so that's what you kind of hear in these first 11 verses. So therefore, it's almost like, okay, now what are you going to do? Encourage each other. And then the latter verses begin to give, I believe, some descriptives of how this encouragement should look. So if we continue to read in verses 12 to 14 today, we're going to get our first three answers to the question, how can we start living life to encourage one another? It says this, but we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction. Why? Because they also need encouragement. We'll drill deeper. And it says, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly. Encourage the fainthearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Do, Do you hear that? You see the steps of how this start, this should start looking, right? So here's the first, verses 12 uh, through 13a. Living to encourage is to appreciate those that serve you. You know, sometimes those who serve can be so underappreciated. It's kind of like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. And if you're a paid, paid staff person, well, that's what you are paid to do. But let's go deeper. Verse 12 says, appreciate them. Belonging to one's household, that's what it means. Appreciate them to a point that they belong to your household. Because chances are, there's a little more loving grace to those who live in your household. It's more than just a hired hand. It also means related by blood devoted to. That's what the word appreciate means, is that when you appreciate someone, you're treating them as though they're related to you as blood. Why would God say that? It's because we have greater tolerance, greater appreciation for those who are blood. You see, to appreciate a servant leader is to be devoted and dedicated, and there's this sense of loyalty that is required which says, I'm going to show up when I say I'm going to show up and not leave you hanging. That I got your back. That I'll be there with you. That I'll run the race with you. That if you need me to take the baton, I'm there for you. We know ultimately loyalty and dedication and devotion is to Jesus. But if someone is trying to lead you to Jesus and they don't feel a sense of loyalty and devotion and and dedication, just imagine how that feels. Verse 13, it says, esteem them very highly in love. It means to consider them very highly, to think of them in very very highly. Uh, So many times what happens is Yes, we get it. We're all flesh and blood. We all report to Jesus. We all do. But there is still a responsibility to esteem those people who serve you day in and day out faithfully. That's why I personally personally struggled with this early in ministry 
people call me pastor. But then, you know, I began to appreciate it and realize, you know what it was? It was a term of endearment. That's why, <laughs> here's the funny thing. When some people call me by my first name, we've kind of have a kind of like a healthy balance, Pastor Cedric. Some environments, no, it's Pastor Brown because of the formality of the term of endearment. There are people who get offended when I'm not called pastor because they guard me here. That's what I've started to realize. When someone, hey, hey, Cedric, I've seen, people, I've seen people's hair on their back crawl. <laughs> and people have literally approached me and said, hey, what's up with that? They call you by your first name. <laughs> and again, I don't think we're all confused with that as a church. You follow me? I'm not expecting all that, but I get it. It's a term of endearment. It's like, no, we esteem you. We respect you. We love you. That's why there's some people who are called pastors sometimes in our church, even before they are officially pastors. <laughs> It's because their servitude towards that person then causes his reciprocation of shepherd. To appreciate serving leaders is to grow in your love for them. It's just a fact. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 and 18 helps us describe how and why you should appreciate those who serve you. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. That's our gift to you. That's our responsibility to you. And if we're not considering that, we're off track. Why? So that they may do this with joy, not groaning. For this will be unhelpful for you. Pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience desire to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. You see, when you pray for your servant leaders, it always shows appreciation. Make sense? So you know, I have this, this wonderful idea to do this today, if you don't mind, if you could bear with me. So um, for those who are here today who serve in any capacity uh, of commitment, can you stand up? If you formally serve in any capacity. All right. I see people standing up from the parking ministry to the pulpit. Could you do me a big favor for them? On three, can you say, I appreciate you? Uh, I appreciate on three, on three. One, on three, on three. One, two, three. I appreciate you. Hopefully that felt good. Amen? Be, you may be seated. Secondly, living to encourage is to live in peace. It's to live in peace. Look at the latter part of verse 13. Live in peace with one another. To live in peace means this. It means to cultivate or keep harmony, to be at peace, and also to what? Make peace. You cultivate peace if it's not there. You keep it if it is there. You be at peace and you make peace. In John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus described who's available to help us with peace. It says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So you have peace, the peacemaker in you. So the ability to live in peace is already in you. So if you are always up at night and you have distress and, and no peace, it's not because peace is not available to you personally, and you don't need someone else to be a peacemaker technically and theologically to help you be at peace because he lives in you. Amen. Amen. 
But here's the wonderful picture that we should all gravitate to. If we all are living in peace, can you imagine how peaceful the environment is? If we're all allowing the peacemaker to live and flow and operate in us, day in and day out, can you imagine how peaceful life will be? You see, to live in peace is to cultivate who's already in us. Peace is already in us. And if peace isn't available or expressively present in you, it's not because he's not there. Next, you find in John 14, 26 and 27, later down in this passage, it says Jesus affirms uh, what's available to us. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father was sent in my name, he would teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. Peace I live, I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. So connecting it all, right? Peacemaker, the Spirit of God. And then he simply just says, you know what? He gives us peace. Again, we're, not, we're without excuse. Then in Hebrews 12, 14 and 15, he challenges us to pursue and strive for peace because it's connected to holiness. So think about that, the, the opposite of that. Whenever there's an environment that is not peaceful, chances are there's wickedness going on. There's sin in the camp. And that's why he says pursue peace with all people. Because if you don't pursue peace with all people, sin will be present. Pursue peace with all people and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Peace, holiness, connected. connected. Why is it so important? If you want to see him. Well, you know when you die, you're going to see him. If he comes back, you're going to see him. But do you want to see him now? He doesn't entertain nonsense. He will not be in a church. He will not be present in a ministry. He will not be present in a home. He will not be present in any place in the marketplace where there's not his peace. Because there's nonsense going on. There's division. There's pride. There's all these other things that... That, that backbiting and all these things that go on when peace isn't present. Therefore, holiness will never be present. Peace there, holiness will come. Peace there, holiness will be there, especially if it's peace that he's given to you. Lastly, Romans 12, 18, further exclaims that peace depends on you and me and us. So think about that. He says to you and I, I, I give you my Holy Spirit. He's going to be there to help you. Uh, I want to affirm that with come, what, come, what comes with the Holy Spirit is my peace. There's this responsibility to pursue it. And it all depends on us. So you can say it this way in, in the Cedric commentary. <laughs> is that at the end of the day, if you don't have peace in your life, it's not God's fault, it's yours. If you are in, um, um, in relationships and in conflict and it doesn't seem as though peace is possible, it's not because of God, it's our fault. It's our fault. If you're not getting along with someone, it's not God's fault, it's your fault. It's our fault. It's not his fault. And I believe the quicker an individual can recognize that, the quicker peace arrives. The quicker I can admit, you know, sucks, something's wrong here. We're having com family conflict. Marriage is not getting, you know, there's not peaceful. It seems like in every situation that looks like this, it, there's conflict, there's a lack of peace. We can quickly say, well, if they change, if they, if they, if they correct their behavior, if they do it differently, if they are, we can bring peace with us. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yes. Yes. 
We have to become makers of peace. And that's why you look at Romans 12. It says, if possible, we know it's possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. It's not depending on the people, but it's depending on the person. Me. To be at peace with everybody. Listen, truth be told, there will be people who won't be at peace with you. Because the Spirit of God would convict them every time you come around. But it doesn't mean that you have to feel awkward. Because you're at peace with them. Finally, for today, verse 14 It says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Living life to encourage is to show patience to all. In the church, the tendency is to not... I say the church, big C, church, is to not show patience with people who should know, to, you know, who should know what they should be doing. It's to not show pay patience with people even who are aged. In other words, an older person is like, why are you tripping? You know, you 50 years old. Shouldn't you, <laughs> should you, why are you acting like a kid, right? I mean, that's, that's the tendency. He's like, well, you shouldn't be acting like a kid now because you're really acting like a child. Uh, we lose patience with people uh, when, um, let's say, we've overcome what they're struggling with. Well, what, why take? Why is it taking you so long? And we forget how long it took us. You know, those are just some of the scenarios that we somehow try to lose in patience with, right? Uh, I can't believe you still smoking cigarettes. You know, you just trust the Lord like I did. I just cut quick, you know, cold turkey. I just walked away from it. <laughs> well, that ain't. They're not you. <laughs> right? I can't believe it. You know, you're still doing it. Oh, and we get so, we make people and make us so irritated. And it's funny, we then become the unruly person. You know, it, it's kind of strange. But it says be patient. The word patient means this, to be a long, a long spirit, not to lose heart with a person to be patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others. Somebody can do something absolutely wrong to you and someone you love, but our responsibility is to be patient in bearing those offenses and those injuries. That's the realness and the rub that happens in the church. Someone you love, maybe in the church, will get Injured by someone else, and the tendency is you take the side of the person versus taking the side of Jesus. And many times we don't even know the full background of why a person is acting a certain way. But no, no, they they hurt that person, and I'm going to attack. You know, they heard, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help God out. And right, it never works out. <laughs> never works out well. So the word patient also is defined as to be mild and slow in avenging. There will be times that we do have to take action. Mildness, right? Walking gingerly in the moment. Uh, spirit-led in the moment. But also it says slow to avenge because we can't get ahead of God. Because he's ultimately, he's the ultimate avenger. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay, right? And then it says to be long-suffering, slow to anger, and also slow to punish. Because there's times that, yeah, you be angry, but angry, and what? Sin not. And also there's times that punishment or consequences are necessary, but take your time. Because how would you want to be treated if you were in that same situation? When you want somebody to be patient, when you offend and, and hurt someone, when you want someone to be slow to pass judgment on you, find out the full story 
when it's your time that you even accidentally injured someone. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, describes how humility and gentleness births patience and how patience ultimately arrives at unity. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Personally, one thing I've learned in life is if there's this need to deal with things and even deal with hard things, I must always be on guard to make sure it is done in a way that that sacred bridge for that person to cross back over to finish the conversation always remains. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, we could be so on fire that we're just burning up everything in route because I'm going to do the work of the Lord. I'm going to put you in your place and I'm going to tell you what you need to say, you know, what you need said to you. I'm going to make sure you pay for the consequences and the injuries of everybody I love. Don't burn the bridge. The sacred bridge that should always remain that when that person comes to his senses, they can cross back over and say, hey, can we talk? Casualty should never, ever, ever be a part of the equation. That's why it's important to be patient, to be led by the Spirit, to be meticulous, to be, to be a person that understands that in all of this, Jesus must be glorified, his reputation must be preserved, and unity must be the aim and the end all. Even for, even for a moment or season, we disagree. To show one another patience is an expression of love. And whenever you feel a little anxious and you feel that you, you got to take care of some, some business that belongs to God, slow your roll. Amen. Because chances are love is nowhere to be found. Take your time. Let them deal with your heart. So that what comes out of your heart is healing, is restoration, is the love of Jesus, even if it's a hard saying. Because we got to believe that everything that I say to this person and need to deal with, even if it is, and I use punishment lightly because ultimately God has that privilege, but if it's discipline, let's say, in the church, Discipline in the home, whatever. Discipline on the job. Got to use the grace of God. Let me give you this example. There was this employee of mine who I hired, then I got promoted, so I had someone in between him and me. I could tell the story because some of you have met him, he and his wife. And God is doing some cool things in his life. At that time, I think he had nine or eight kids, or ten. Oh, 10 kids, nine and one on the way. He wasn't doing his job. My regional manager would come up to me and say, Cedric, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this guy? He's not showing up. The customers are complaining. The Lord said, you got to take care of it because you hired him. I said, wait a minute, but I'm the boss's boss now. I'm like, can I just tell him to fire him? <laughs> the Lord says, it's your job to go fire him. I mean, think about the emotional context of that. So I, I fired him with grace. Years pass. <laughs> I'm now uh, retired, heading into full-time ministry. I'm in my office here at the church. Doorbell rings. Guess who it is? The guy I fired years ago. He shows up. I'm like, okay, God, what was all this going to lead to? <laughs> he says, with tears, I want to thank you for firing me. 
He said, it changed my life, saved my marriage, saved my family. And my wife and I are now serving uh, with Family Life Today, teaching marriage classes. He said, oh, by the way, God restored me, have a wonderful job, X, Y, Z. I've personally seen, if you do it the right way, people cross back over. And this, this couple, this guy who I fired, came back to minister in our church. To me, that's redemption. That's Jesus. That's the cross. That's everything he died for. Everything he died for is to redeem. Second chances, third chances, hundred chances. Yeah, there's consequences. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. When a man sows, he's going to reap. Let God deal with all the reaping and sowing stuff. It ain't our job. But it is our job and responsibility to appreciate people uh, that serve you, you know, to live in peace and get to a point that we become so patient with people around us. Like he is so patient with us. Amen? Let's pray. Can, can you just spend some time right now and just ask the Lord, what are these areas that you need to grow in, live in more than ever? Maybe as a leader that um, you feel underappreciated, well, maybe it's your responsibility to be okay with that until God moves in the people's heart that you serve. Or maybe you're being served faithfully by a leader and you haven't expressed or shown appreciation towards them. Maybe you haven't been loyal to that person. Maybe it's time to check your heart and reestablish loyalty because we know it's really not loyalty to the man or woman, but it's loyalty to God through the man and the woman. Maybe it's time to pray that you grow to love them. Maybe there's a lack of peace in your life personally, lack of peace in important environments in your life, like your ministry, like your home, like your job. Maybe, it's not, maybe there's no peace in your community. Maybe it's time to be the peacemaker. Do you need to start just being a little bit more patient with people? Because he is so patient with you. He's so patient with us. Patiently giving God time to do what he does best in all of our hearts. Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.